Ah, hello. Good, you've come out into the garden. I'm finally back in the hut doing what I really want to do, which is working on the, on the Arthur poem. You know, these lovely roses that Maggie planted for me are blooming again. I don't know the second or third time. In a little magical circular rose garden. Come in, come in. It's a bit warm in the shed, but um, I can lay open. So you'll see, I have here, here's all <laughs> lovely things. But I have here um, all the things I need, basically, to uh, to work on the poem. So I've got Mallory, the prime source, and um, I'm just to the bit where they're all on the, on the magic ship, on Solomon's ship, and there's amazing pages of description of the history of the ship. And then I've also been using this rather lovely retelling. Um, this is the beautiful puffin. It's actually Maggie's, I think. Um, the Roger Lancelin Green retelling, a friend of C.S. Lewis. Sometimes just to get some guidance on, because there's so many strange repetitions and variations and um, from the circular bits in Mallory, you have to find a, a path through. But also here, you'll see one of my manuscript books. I completely filled that one. I went on to this one, which had been used for other things, and I just, I thought, oh, I've got a few more pages left. And I came to the end of where I was writing there and realised there was another poem. That was from my after prayer sequence. So I've been using that. So I've now gone on to his uh, yet another manuscript book that I just started. You can see lots of crossings out. So I have the manuscript books. Um, but um, I've had all these travels to the States and to conferences in Oxford and generally rather more business than I'd, I'd like you know, for a working poet. Um, so I've had to some extent read and almost hear myself back in. So I also have, just to get my mind into the right rhythms and inspire me with what's possible, I had this book which I showed to you, uh, if you remember, nearly two years ago. It was on, um, on King Alfred's day which is the 29th of October, in 2020, when we were right in the midst of the lockdown and you somehow found your way to me and I showed you this lovely first edition of the Ballad of the White Horse. Here is Chesterton taking up the ballad form. And this, this is the first edition, look, um, beautiful paper. Um, first published in 1911. In fact, I bought it in 2011. And um, uh, it's a poem dedicated to his wife, Frances. And um, last time when I read to you from this, I, uh, I read the great passage where Alfred is about to despair and give up and, and he has a vision of Mary and she tells him these wonderful words, you know, I, I tell you not for your comfort and not for your desire save that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher. But it's about having courage and choice, even at the worst of odds of doing the right thing, even if you think you'll be defeated. And that's what sets uh, Alfred going again. Uh, so I read that to you and talked to you about how those lines have come back in various points in English history, quoted directly from that poem. But I was rereading, really just to get the rhythm and the sound, but also because because Chesterton had a sense that both history and be behind history, legend and myth, have a kind of current life, that, that there's, a, there's an older England, there's a deeper song in the soil, as it were, that sometimes in times of crisis, such as we're living through now, we, we need to hear again. So I thought I'd read you the dedication. It's just, he just says simply, to my wife, Francis, whom he, he, he loved all his life and who, really rescued him. He was in quite a bad state. Um, his chapter on that pre-married state of his life is called How to Be a Maniac. And um, she brought him faith. She was a devout Anglican and he became a, an Anglican, and, but more fundamentally a Christian through her influence. And um, 
then later on, of course, he became a Roman Catholic, and eventually she had had some sacrifice in terms of Roman. She joined him in that church. But to my mind, which branch is neither here nor there, he he wants to um, to acknowledge in this dedication the immense role she had in in giving him and sustaining for him his faith. But in the course of it, the dedication, he also he has this really extraordinary phrase about the Englands, the different Englands, the layers of England lying underneath each other. And um, and I, I think that's, uh, that's something that, that's entered into my own approach to the, uh, the making of my ballads. His is about Alfred, of course, and mine is about Arthur, though he alludes to Arthur at various points in his. So here's the dedication, and you'll hear immediately the rhythm the music that I'm also trying to find in my own Arthurian poetry. So here's the dedication. Of great limbs gone to chaos, a great face turned to night. Why bend above a shapeless shroud, seeking in such archaic cloud sight of strong lords and light? Where seven sunken Englands lie buried one by one, why should one idle spade, I wonder, shake up the dust of things like thunder to smoke and choke the sun? In cloud of clay so cast to heaven, what shape shall man discern? These lords may light the mystery of mastery or victory, and these ride high in history, but these shall not return. Gored on the Norman Gonfalon, the golden dragon died. We shall not wake with ballad strings the good time of the smaller things. We shall not see the holy kings ride down by seven side. Wonderful. So in one sense he's saying, how can I possibly revive these things? They're gone. But then he goes on. Stiff, strange and quaintly coloured as the broidery of Bayeux, the England of that dawn remains, and this of Alfred and the Danes seems like a tale, a whole tribe feigned, too English to be true, of a good king on an island that ruled once on a time, and as he walked by an apple tree, there came green devils out of the sea, with sea plants trailing heavily and tracks of opal slime. Yet, Alfred is no fairy tale. His days as our days ran, he also looked forth for an hour on peopled plains and skies that lower from those few windows in the tower that is the head of a man. But who shall look from Alfred's hood or breathe his breath alive? His century, like a small dark cloud, drifts far. It is an eyeless crowd where the tortured trumpets scream aloud and the dense arrows drive. So it's the question, how can we even begin to see the world as Alfred saw it? And then comes a clue. And the clue is that he saw it as a Christian. And that's how, thanks to Francis, his wife, Chesterton sees it too. So now he turns directly to speak to his wife. Lady, by one light only, we look from Alfred's eyes. We know he saw athwart the wreck, the sign that hangs about your neck where one more than Melchizedek is dead and never dies. Therefore, I bring these rhymes to you, who brought the cross to me. Since on you, flaming without flaw, I saw the sign that Guthrum saw when he let break his ships of oar and laid peace on the sea. Do you remember when we went under a dragon moon and mid volcanic tints of night walked where they fought the unknown fight and saw black trees on the battle height, black thorn on Ethan Dune? And glorious and gorgeous, that sounds like it's literally true. He wanted to write the poem and he and his wife went on a wonderful slow jaunt to down to Frome and Somerset and through the West Country and all the bits of Wessex and to Ethendoon where the battle that this poem celebrates was fought. Blackthorn on Ethendoon. And I thought, I will go with you as man with God has gone and wander with a wandering star, the wandering heart of things that are, the fiery cross of love and war that like yourself goes on. Oh, go you onward, 
where you are shall honour and love to be. Past purple forest and pearled foam, God's winged pavilion free to roam, your face that is a wandering home, a flying home to me. Ride through the silent earthquake lands, wild as a waste is wide, across these days like deserts, when pride and a little scratching pen have dried and split the hearts of men. Heart of the heroes, ride up through an empty house of stars, being what heart you are, up the inhuman steeps of space, as on a staircase, go in grace, carrying the firelight on your face beyond the loneliest star. Take these, in memory of the hour we strayed a space from home, and saw the smoke-hued hamlets quaint with Westland King and Westland Saint, and watched the Western glory faint along the road to Fran. It's wonderful how he ends this kind of cosmic dedication with this just remembering a raid from from Frome in the West Country and um, and this lovely vision of the light on his wife's face as being something that will sort of rise higher then and endure beyond the stars and so he dedicates the verse to her and uh, one of the verses in this that interests me is there's a almost there's a little hint or recollection of a a deep image, not in the Alfred story, but in the Arthur story, which is the knights riding through the wasteland to seek the cup and the spear, which will eventually bring healing to the wasteland. Um, ride through the silent earthquake lands, wide as a waste is wide, across these days like deserts. And then he says the wasteland in our time is not caused it's not outward and visible in quite the way it was in the Arthurian story, but it's to do with the age of cynicism, the age of materialism, the kind of scepticism and reductivism that, that blighted his age. And he says, he describes that as when pride and a little scratching pen have dried and split the hearts of men. That's amazing. But then he says to his wife, heart of the heroes, ride. It's a, it's a really fine dedication. And, uh, re-inspires me to get on with my own uh, poem, not about Alfred, but about Arthur, which, thanks be to God, after many months of absence and destruction, I return to at least for a week or so. Thanks for dropping around. Good to see you. Cheers. <laughs>